Hello, this is Marla Dalton, Executive Director and CEO of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, or NFID. Following a thorough safety review, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, have determined that the recommended pause regarding the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine in the U.S. should be lifted and use of the vaccine should resume. The pause was recommended after reports of rare blood clots in a small number of vaccinated individuals. FDA and CDC have determined that the vaccine benefits outweigh the risks and will continue to monitor the use of the vaccine. Additionally, the vaccine insert will include a warning that in rare cases, blood clotting has occurred in women under age 50 who received the vaccine. Joining me today is NFID Medical Director, Dr. William Schaffner, to explain the decision and how it may impact confidence in COVID-19 vaccines. Bill, as always, thanks for joining us. Oh, always good to be with you. So why the change in thinking about the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Well, Marla, actually, you've summarized it very well. Uh, let's go back. The, uh, the problem was that in very rare instances, there was this blood clotting disorder that involved the veins in the brain and the abdomen. It was potentially uh, serious, and these blood clotting disorders were really distinctive, different from the usual kinds of blood clots that you might get in a leg, for example, which are really pretty common. The pause was important because the CDC and this advisory committee wanted to get more information to define the risk. Where, in, in which sorts of patients did these illnesses occur and how frequently? Uh, men and women by age, let's have a look at that. And they also wanted the opportunity to get the word out to the medical community about this complication and the fact that is, it was distinctive and had to be treated in a different way. Well, during that period of time of the pause, data came in that defined the risk much more precisely. And the advisory committee thought very carefully about this rare risk in comparison to the risk of COVID, which is continuing to spread along with the variants. And what they said was basically what you've said, Assessing the risks on both sides, the risk of thrombosis versus the risk of COVID, as well as the benefits that you could get from the vaccination, they thought the benefits largely, hugely outweighed the potential rare risks. And then the FDA did what they always do, when they have any kind of drug or vaccine, uh, when you do have a rare risk associated with treatment, for example, they put a warning on the label. Hello, everyone, pay attention. This is not risk-free. This serious event can occur, but it occurs very rarely. And having thought about and discussed this, the CDC's advisory committee said, Let's go forward. This vaccine, which is a single dose vaccine, can be handled at normal refrigerator temperatures so we can reach underserved populations. And a lot of people like the one and done. Let's go ahead and continue to use it with a warning. Hmm. So how rare is blood clotting among these vaccine recipients? And frankly, what should healthcare professionals and patients know about the risks? Well, let's do a few numbers. There were 15 of these cases that were reported. All were in women, and they were in younger women. Uh, 13 of them occurred in women ages 18 to 49. The other two were in women who were just over 50. Now, in this age group, uh, if we look at the 18 to 49 years old, let's divide them in two, if you're still with me. First, we're going to go to the younger women, 18 to 29. There were five cases 
per million doses of vaccine. So that's one in about 200,000. Now, in women aged 30 to 39, there were more cases, and that rate was about 11 per million or one per every 100,000. So you can see, still pretty darn rare. Um, you know, in context, <laughs> I've heard that your chance every year of being struck by lightning is about one in a million. So you're down in that order of magnitude. And it was clearly thought that, um, that the benefits, given the fact that COVID is out there making many, many people sick and still putting people into the hospital, that the benefits here manifestly outweighed the potential risk, as long as people were knowledgeable about this risk. Hmm. So turning to practicality, Bill, what advice would you give to women under age 50 about COVID-19 vaccination? Oh, the first thing I would say is get vaccinated. Uh, clearly, the benefits outweigh the risk. And then, you know, we have plenty of vaccine out there, plenty of the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. So if you're a little bit concerned about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, even though it's one dose uh, and you prefer now to get the Pfizer or Moderna, you'll have to do a little homework on the front end to find out which locations have the different vaccines. More locations will try to have a choice available, but frankly, I think the vast majority of locations that provide vaccines will continue in the near term future to have only one vaccine available. But please do get vaccinated. Hmm. Very important. So, Bill, futurescaping a bit, what impact, if any, will this pause have on COVID-19 vaccine confidence and vaccine uptake? Well, the two sides to that coin. Uh, the first is that we've been reminding everybody that these events should instill real confidence in our vaccine safety um, mechanism to uh, determine uh, vaccine safety. Um, we monitor this very carefully for all vaccines all the time, but this whole complex mechanism has been enhanced to monitor the safety of COVID vaccines. And they found this, uh, this needle in a haystack, right? I mean, think of it. Uh, they found this unusual syndrome, defined it, gathered data, the CDC analyzed it. We had an emergency meeting of the advisory committee. More data were gathered, and we had another meeting that once again debated in a transparent fashion. Anybody in the United States could have tuned in and watched this discussion in real time. It's a model of transparency. And the committee very carefully discussed and then voted to go ahead. And there was general approval of the public health community of that decision, both for going ahead and using this vaccine and other vaccines in the United States and also globally. So that's the good side. There is another side to that coin because all this hullabaloo did raise questions about vaccine hesitancy, of course. And Yes, more people have expressed more hesitancy, and we're going to have to reach out to them, make them comfortable and reassured. And in this regard, the NFID has developed resources on the website to enhance communication about vaccine hesitancy. I'd love to see everyone who's been vaccinated make sure everyone in their family's vaccinated, their neighbors. Uh, if you're having a game of bridge or poker, talk it up. If some of your friends haven't been vaccinated yet, ask them why that is, and please provide some reassurance. We need to vaccinate more and more people, adults, all the time to assure that we can suppress the transmission of this deadly virus. The variants are out there. 
the vaccines currently do cover the variants. So let's use them to maximum benefit to prevent this disease in as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Well said, as always. Bill, thanks again for joining us for this edition of the Schaffner Report. We'll look forward to speaking again soon. Bye-bye. Until next time.